Let's begin with our opening hymn, hymn number 749, God who is giving knows no end. May God bless our worship. Please stand as we continue our service now on page three of the service program. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be a Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy for the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. 
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us forsake all trust in earthly gain and find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We give our attention now to the chosen readings for God's word for today, a day in which uh, following the Lord in faith is the emphasis, and the specific emphasis is on, with that following the Lord in faith, we prioritize things in our lives for God's glory and for the sake of our faith and the blessing of those around us. Our first reading is from the second book of Kings, uh, chapter 5, beginning at verse 14. Uh, Chapter 5 of 2 Kings is the fairly familiar account of Naaman, the, the general of the, um, one of the invading armies of Israel who had leprosy, and he was um, encouraged by a servant girl of, of his who was an Israelite, a believer in the true God, uh, to go to Israel to talk to the prophet Elisha uh, that he might be healed of his leprosy. Well, eventually he did go and, and was healed, and uh, Elisha made it, made it clear that this was the Lord's doing. And so when Naaman then offered Elisha uh, uh, some great gifts, some thank you gifts, Elisha had refused so that Naaman would not get the wrong ideas that that you can pay for a gift from God. You can repay God for his grace. And so Elisha just wanted uh, Naaman to know that this is God's doing. This is God's grace. Enjoy the healing, the blessing of God. And and Naaman did go home uh, seemingly believing in God. However, Elisha's servant Gehazi had a different idea. He thought that he could take advantage of this blessing from God and and make some money off of it for himself. 
May we learn from this and never think that we deserve something from God or that we can repay God or, or that um, he should be paying us for being faithful followers. Uh, may we learn to not let even our love of things of this life get in the way of God's grace and faith and that grace and faith being clear to everybody around us. So long reading it begins with this. So he, that is um, Naaman, uh, went down and dipped in the Jordan seven times, just as the man of God, that's Elisha the prophet, had said. Then his flesh was restored like the flesh of a small child, and he was clean. Then he and his whole escort went back to the man of God. He stood in front of Elisha and said, To be sure, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, in whose presence I stand, I will not take anything. Even though Naaman urged him to accept something, he refused. Then Naaman said, If you do not want anything, please give me, your servant, as much dirt as two donkeys can carry, for your servant will never again burn incense or sacrifice to other gods, but only to the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. When my master goes into the house of Rimen, that was one of the false gods of the Arameans, to bow down there, and he supports himself on my arm, then I too have to bow down in the house of Rimen. When I bow down in the house of Rimen, may the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. Then Elisha said to him, go in peace. When Naaman had gone some distance from him, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, My master was too easy on this Aramean, Naaman, when he did not accept anything that he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi chased after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. He said, is everything all right? Then Gehazi said, yes, everything is all right. My master sent me to say, look, just now two young men from the hill country of Ephraim, from the sons of the prophets, have come to me. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. Naaman said, certainly, take two talents. He urged Gehazi and tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with the two sets of clothing. The Naaman gave them to his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When he came to the hill, he took the gifts from them. Then he hid them in the house and sent the men back, so they left. Then he went in and attended his master. Elisha said to him, Where are you, Gehazi? Gehazi said, Your servant didn't go anywhere. Then Elisha said to him, didn't my heart go along when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take silver or to accept clothes or olive groves or vineyards or sheep or cattle or male and female servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went out from his presence, leprous like snow. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is number 90. Um, It has the title or theme, Lord, give success to the work of our hands. And today we'll read the the verses that are there printed, a selection of verses. We'll read them responsively. And as we read them, we'll we'll note the words, that it is from God's hand, from God's blessing, that we, we are what we are, we do what we do. May our lives always demonstrate that as we give God the glory as we receive his blessings. Lord, you have been our dwelling place before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. 
In the morning, it springs up new. Our days may come to 70 years. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. Teach us to number our days. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading for today is from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Hebrews, the, the whole book of Hebrews has an emphasis on Christ, Christ for us, Christ our Savior. Turn away from putting trust in other things uh, and put trust in Christ alone. And of course, that was what the message that Gehazi, uh, Elisha would have wanted Gehazi to learn, what uh, Naaman uh, did learn. Uh, in our re later reading today, the gospel reading, we'll, we'll hear about that further as Jesus wanted uh, a wealthy young man to learn that, to not trust in things, but to put trust in Christ. And it is God's word that really pokes at our hearts, that exposes that misplaced trust, and in that way carries out the wonderful thing. As it exposes our misplaced trust, we see it and then know and are called to turn away from it and to put our trust in Christ. So we hear these words from Hebrews. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the point of dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, even being able to judge the ideas and thoughts of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from him, but everything is uncovered and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we will give an account. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for today's gospel reading. We begin with the gospel acclamation. Alleluia, for the word of God is alive and active. The Holy Gospel for today is Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. As a, a young man uh, comes to Jesus, Jesus wants to expose his heart with, with his words, showing him that he was putting trust in things, uh, not in, in Jesus. That's what Jesus and what God's word does for all of us, what he wants it to do for all of us, so that all of us, this young man included, would then hear the wonderful words that, yeah, Serving God, loving him, being saved is, is impossible for us, but it is completely possible for God because God does it for us. Jesus did it for us. So it says, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, one man ran up to him and knelt in front of him. He asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, Teacher, I have kept all these since I was a child. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack. Go sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he looked sad and went away grieving because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. 
But Jesus told them again, children, how hard it is for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to one another, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for people, it is impossible, but not for God, because all things are possible for God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the next hymn. The words of the hymn uh, direct us, of course, away from things, away from ourselves, uh, to Christ. Your works, not mine, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do you think that was hard for that young man to come to Jesus to ask him what more he could do to inherit eternal life? The words we just heard in, in Mark chapter uh, 10, uh, beginning at verse 17, that speak of uh, this rich young man, a rich young ruler, it seemed that he uh, maybe was a, 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 lead, a community leader, a leader in the synagogues, a religious leader, and wealthy, and maybe he had received his wealth from his uh, family, but um, was the perfect man, the, uh, wealthy, uh, well-to-do, um, generous, keeping the laws, the commandments, a leader in his community, he would be the one that everybody else in the, his community would be saying to their children, be like him. And we might too say, yeah, I wish we could, I could be like him. I wish everybody could be like him. But being like him, obviously, 
was kind of hard. As the, the reading says, uh, that he had come looking for one more thing he could do. He had done everything he thought was re required. The commandments, and uh, in the conversation with Jesus, the commandments are listed, the, the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth, and then the fourth. All those commandments, and, and he had been doing them since he was a child. But something, something was getting at him. Something was nagging um, him from the inside, saying, there, I don't feel like I'm saved. I don't feel like I've done enough. I don't feel like I like God would welcome me into heaven, welcome me to eternal life, saying, yes, you've, you've earned your spot here. Something is missing. And so today, as we take a look at this account again, uh, may, may we too uh, feel today like, yeah, something is, is missing from the way we've lived our lives uh, this past week. Something is missing from what the, the lives that we, we want to then live in the week ahead. Something's missing from all the, the words we've heard over the last weeks that have really struck at our hearts after last week. I went home, maybe you went home. Boy, I just can't meet up to God's standard of being a, a loving, sacrificing husband and father all the time. How much I am not that. Or the words for a wife or, or the children, I'm always honoring their, their parents and it how long does it take when we, we realize, yeah, I'm not always honoring those in authority over me. And as I watched the news this week, my heart was filled with that lack of respect for those in authority. How do we get away from that? What more can we do? And so maybe it's a good thing that we come to Jesus kind of feeling like this rich young man. What, what more is there? And then coming and, and hearing from Jesus, grieving a little bit. But then, as we consider the, the possibilities of what we could then do and the impossibility of doing them, um, staying with Jesus, keeping on following him because he has the answer for what can be done to give us the gift of eternal life. And, of course, that is what he has done for us. So consider the possibilities for this young man. It says he came to Jesus, uh, um, calling him good teacher, good teacher, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so recognizing Jesus was a, a good teacher and um, uh, maybe a better teacher than the other teachers that he had had. had. And that maybe Jesus, being a very good teacher, might have something more that other teachers had not taught him. And even it says he, he knelt in front of Jesus, and so respect and honor for Jesus as a teacher of God's Word. Certainly everything is in place there. Consider the possibilities for this, this young man, such respect for Jesus, recognizing that Jesus is truly a good teacher, and, and maybe thinking um, that maybe he is one of the, the great teachers of, of God's Word, one to listen to, of course, listening to God's Word, is what God would want. And then the young man, um, not being satisfied with how he had been living his life, and so consider the possibilities for that. How wonderful that somebody is, is so not, not self-satisfied in themselves that they're looking at what more they could do, where they could volunteer, what cause they could take up, further cause they could take up beyond what they're already doing. And so consider the possibilities for, for this man. For being a, a follower of Jesus, yes, he should be one that should be a, a, a prime uh, one for Jesus to, to choose to follow him. For leader, a leader in his community and in his local church, the synagogue, yes, what, a, what possibilities there were for this young man. Yes, what good he could do. He's got a heart and wants to do more good. However, there was the, the problem. He didn't know it. Maybe those around him didn't know it. His community, his family didn't, didn't know it. But clearly, he did not know 
where he really was falling short of God's will and word. He couldn't see it because of the life he was living. He was very, very proud of himself, and maybe he doesn't even express that pride that much, but very self-satisfied in how he had been doing things right, living right. His wealth, that he speaks of, it says later he had great wealth, but it doesn't, notice it doesn't say that he really prided himself in his wealth. It doesn't say that he flaunted it or that he loved it so much that um, he just couldn't imagine not having it. Probably the way he talked about, you know, keeping these, all these commandments, he probably saw his wealth as a, a way to carry out his responsibilities. Maybe thinking, yeah, I've been blessed with this great wealth, now a great trust that I have to carry out, and, and I use it for the community, use it for my community, use it for my family, drive for myself. If I have this great wealth, then I can volunteer more, I can serve in the community as a, a community leader, as a church leader, I can do all those things that are so very pleasing to God. So, what was that? It maybe wasn't the love of his wealth that was the problem. But as it said in Hebrews about God's word, God's word has a way of getting to the heart of things, getting to our hearts, exposing our our sin, our sinful attitudes, even when a list of commandments, even with the people around us, even with our own minds, we can't see the problem, see the sin. But Jesus did. And so we notice Jesus' reaction to this man who, who says, yeah, yeah, I've kept all these commandments. Jesus didn't react. He said, no, you have not. He didn't get into an argument with him about how he had been keeping the, those commandments. He very calmly in love, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. With this man, with, with every single person, Jesus looks at, at everyone with love, so wanting us to follow him, to put our faith in him, to be saved and to be with him in eternity in heaven, to be part of God's family, to, be, to call us a brother and a sister. Jesus so wants that and so in love wants to do everything to make that possible and to give that uh, to this man. And so it says, Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing. So here's the getting at his heart, and this is not for everybody, but it was for this man. One thing you lack, give whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. A side note, we would be wrong in, in taking this uh, invitation from Jesus and applying it to everyone saying, okay, so we all should give away everything we have and, and follow Jesus. That's not the Jesus point here, or maybe for, for any of us, but it was his point for this man because of what it exposed in this man. Not a love for his wealth, but rather a trust in his wealth. Later on, Jesus says how hard it is for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God. And so it was that. Jesus got to the man's heart. It was that that was keeping him from following Jesus, keeping him from the kingdom of God. It was that, putting his trust in his riches rather than in God. So the first commandment is what Jesus was saying is, your, is, is what's wrong in your heart. And finally, isn't that for all of us? We might be able to say we're kind of like this man. We, we keep those commandments pretty well. Maybe after last Sunday that had words about husbands and wives and parents and, and children and uh, those in authority and us, uh, you know, under their authority, we might say, yeah, I'm doing all that. But just thinking and saying that, I'm doing all that, 
better than so many other people. I sure hope other people would be here to hear this, uh, these messages about how to live their lives. That might be it. That might be it that, that Jesus would want to say to me and, and maybe, maybe to you or maybe in a, a little different way. That saying, you know, you're really pretty satisfied with how you're living, how you're keeping the commandments. You're pretty satisfied with yourself. And therefore, that is what is wrong. In my heart, maybe in your heart, and that was part of what was wrong in this man's heart. He was self-satisfied in the way he was living his life, keeping the commandments. And that was then probably replacing his trust in God rather than and then and replacing with trust in riches. So consider the impossibilities then. As we strive to prioritize good in our lives, as this man was looking for, he was one more good thing to do to get eternal life. May we come to the conclusion that it is impossible for us to do enough good things to inherit eternal life. It is impossible for us to be good enough for God. And that's what Jesus wanted to show this man with his pointed question, what God wants to show all of us with his pointed words, the words of his commandments, the words of of the readings like we've been hearing over the past weeks, still especially thinking about last week about um, as a husband and a father and, and all those things, and you're thinking about those words are to you, we conclude that it's impossible. And the disciples were, were amazed at that. They said, wow, um, they're amazed that, that as Jesus talked to this man, um, you know, um, excuse me. So when he heard this, uh, so he looked at, he looked sad, went away grieving because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around at his disciples and said, how hard it will be for those who have riches into the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus told them again. So amazing. Um, wow, Jesus, this is quite the, the challenge to this man. Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so they were amazed at that because the disciples were probably thinking, wait a minute, is Jesus maybe going to start to ask that of us? Some of the disciples had great wealth. Remember Matthew uh, was very wealthy. Other uh, disciples were, were business owners that, that were very successful. In fact, um, as the, re- the gospels speak about Jesus' followers, the, the disciples and the others, it says that um, you know, some of their family members came along to support them. And so they obviously were, were pretty well-to-do. We would call them middle class, you know, doing okay. And so when the disciples were amazed, they were wondering, uh-oh, um, is this what's coming next? Is he going to challenge us the same thing because we could be told that same thing. And Jesus saw where their hearts were going, where our hearts are going as we we worry about this, wonder about this. Could we do it? Could we let go of our wealth or let go of our of the good lives we've been living, being satisfied with our, our good good lives that others should be be marveling at? And so it says they were even more astonished and said to one another, then who can be saved? And finally that's what Really, Jesus wanted them to be thinking, who can be saved if nobody can do enough for God? So what beautiful gospel, good words, good news words from the good teacher, the Savior Jesus. Yes, it is impossible. That's the point. It is impossible for for people to do enough to save themselves but not for God. All things are possible for God. So consider that possibility. God requiring perfection, God providing perfection in Jesus. 
God requiring a payment for sin to cover over all sin, God providing a payment that covers over all sin, and, and more, more than enough in Jesus' life, his life uh, for one life uh, for all sinners. Consider the, the possibilities of, of this great gift from God that cannot be earned, cannot be paid for, but the possibility that comes from the heart of God that in perfect love, in, in perfect grace, and in perfect goodness, gifting to you and to me and to all people, wanting to gift to this man the goodness that the man knew he was falling short of, the, the grace uh, to save him from himself. Consider those possibilities. And maybe that word possibility, maybe it lacks a little bit, maybe it falls short. And maybe Jesus clarified that pretty well when he says, with God, all things are possible. And so not just, yeah, is it possible, but rather it is because it's been done. It's already been taken care of. The gift has already been given. And so as Jesus called the man to follow him, as he has called us to follow, calling us to follow means here's the gift. My forgiveness, my grace, my goodness for you. It's yours. Hold on to it. Trust in it. And keep following. So brothers and sisters in Christ, may every day be a, a day that we consider and are struck to the heart of the impossibility of doing enough for God. And may that send us into our day, really grieving, grieving for ourselves that we have not done the things that we should have done and, and have failed to do that, the things that we, we, we should have done. Get those phrases mixed up in the confession. But may every day be that day that as we consider that impossibility, we, in grief, uh, turn again to the Savior Jesus, the good teacher, the, the good teacher that provides the goodness he is talking to us about, gifting us his goodness and grace each day and forever. In Jesus' name and to his glory, amen. Now may God's peace which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's together confess the good things God has done for us. The Apostles' Creed speaks of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We confess together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us join in prayer. Loving God and Lord, you created the universe that surrounds us and the globe in which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Comfort us with the promise of your eternal presence. Give your word power as it works in our hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world 
from all forms of hate and persecution. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them, them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal, between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Especially bless uh, Mila Schill as she uh, suffers under severe pain of arthritis. Uh, grant her relief. Uh, bless her with, with medical care that might grant that relief. And most importantly, sustain her in faith during this time. And Lord, also we also ask you to be with Lorraine Juman, uh, a cousin of Patrick Paulman, who is still hospitalized after many surgeries after a severe car accident uh, a few months ago. Continue to bless her with, with medical care, uh, with healing and strength of body and, and of faith. Keep her and her family and all in your powerful and gracious care. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. And Heavenly Father, we commend also to your care uh, the, the hurricane victims in Florida and the Carolinas and in Georgia, parts of the southeast of our United States. Help those uh, recover from the, the past two severe hurricanes. Uh, comfort those who mourn the loss of loved ones. Help all to be restored uh, in businesses and in their homes and families in health. And also use this as a time to restore many in faith. And Heavenly Father, as our nation uh, begins to carry out uh, the election uh, this uh, in the weeks ahead, we pray. Heavenly Father, you know all things. You know a person's mind and heart. As our nation faces elections once again, we hear and see conflicting messages. We read promises and wonder if they are valid or just politics as usual. As we consider voting, we pray, give the candidates honest hearts. Make them people of integrity so that they speak the truth and serve this nation well. As they campaign, lead them to focus on the positive aspects of their programs and not on mudslinging and character defamation. Inspire the candidates to use their gifts to serve you and the people of our nation. Give us the wisdom to see which candidates will best promote your kingdom in accordance with your will until you gather your chosen to eternal peace in Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. And now hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Amen. Let us now worship God with our offerings.
Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for the closing hymn. The hymn uh, we walk by, by faith, uh, not by sight, uh, comes from the words uh, from the letter to the Hebrews that uh, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. And so as we sing this hymn, uh, you'll notice the, all the words that direct us to, to our Savior Jesus, what he has done for us, and then that strengthens us for that walk of faith uh, for his glory and for our blessing. By faith.